Well, good morning and welcome welcome to Arrive Together, our, our Transportation Access and Equ Equity Report release. My name is Connie Connitz and I'm from Esther. And we're here today to hear about one of kind, first of its kind report, Arrive Together, Transportation Access and Equity in Wisconsin. I hope everyone signed in. If you haven't, we're going to pass around the clipboard. Um, there is a link to the entire report. Um, and if I have your email, we can send you a copy of that. I find if we've been living in a city for a long time, or if we've not been a regular rider of public transit, we tend not to see it at all. But for people who are visiting our city for the first time, for people who move here, and especially for all of those who depend on it every day, they see it as the backbone of the Fox Cities. It's a connection to destinations and to each other. With Esther, we often talk to bus riders and we hear them identify public transportation as their key to independence. And they tell us that if a destination is not on the bus route, it is not accessible to their lives. And so that's why we're talking today about transportation access and equity. So we have this report that's released today. We're going to hear about it and about how important adequate transit access is to our community. First, we're going to hear from Elizabeth Ward. And she is from Sierra Club. And um, she'll tell you a little bit more about her qualification. She drove here today from Madison. Thanks, Connie. So yes, uh, I'm Elizabeth Ward. I am the programs coordinator for the statewide branch of Sierra Club, and we were one of the authors of the report. So I'm just going to go over some of the highlights of the report, which we do have copies over there, as well as fact sheets that kind of pull out the main points, and you can find it online. Um, so the report called Arrive Together, Transportation Access and Equity in Wisconsin looked at a statewide level at whether or not our transit systems and our transportation system at large was properly providing access for people who um, to get to work, to school, to medical appointments, um, who don't drive, who can't drive, who can't afford to drive, or who don't want to drive. Um, so we looked statewide, and then we also dove into nine cities across the state looking at their transit systems, um, looking at the largest transit system in the state, the Milwaukee County Transit System, as well as little systems like the Namakagan Transit in Hayward that most people don't even know exists. Um, and Appleton was one of the highlight um, cities that we looked at in the Fox Valley Transit System. So statewide, though every kind of city and community has their own challenges and their own opportunities, there were three main takeaways. First, we are not properly investing in our transportation system and in our transit systems. Um, so we're seeing that they are, um, every single transit system in the state is kind of struggling to get by based on the funding they have. That's a result of a couple of different funding cuts at the federal and um, local level, but mostly at the state level. In 2011, there was a pretty big cut to transit in our, um, le leaving our transit systems reeling, and they haven't been able to catch up. The second takeaway, um, kind of as a result, is that our transit system is really leaving a lot of people behind. Um, they're doing the best they can, but they are not properly providing access, um, both whether or not it's the where the transit system goes, but things like the frequency as well as the um, schedule. So even really good transit systems might not really be an option for people who would like to get a second shift job um, and don't drive or work on the weekends. And then the third uh, main takeaway that we saw in every single kind of conversation we had um, with transit providers, with transit uh, riders, and in our analysis was the lack of regional coordination is really hurting our transit system. So not being able to coordinate with municipalities is one of the key barriers. I bet nobody here woke up today in the city that they live in and don't plan on leaving at all. Um, we all go for across municipality lines, whether it's to the next town over, and don't even think about it. That's the way our transit system should operate, but they're not able to operate right now. Kind of diving into Appleton, 
Um, there were kind of a handful of takeaways there. This map here, which I can't see, so you'll have to look for me, it shows, it overlays the transit system with the top 25 employers in the region and income levels based on the Census Bureau. So the red is the lowest income level, um, so you can see the people who probably need most to ensure that they have access to work. As you can tell, aside from a few exceptions, the transit system does a pretty good job of reaching most employers, um, but there are still a few areas of concern um, and a few kind of improvements the system could make. One of the big things when we're just talking to riders or potential um, employees was the lack of service on Sundays. It makes it really difficult for people who um, could potentially get a weekend job and can't get there. And um, the growth in the area, a lot of new developments are happening in places without transit um, access currently, uh, most notably the town of Buchanan. Um, and finally, in our discussions around the area and with the transit system, one of the biggest needs here is, a, uh, is funding for new buses. They've outlived their life, both in mileage as well as age, and definitely need um, new buses. Um, and finally, so kind of back to the broader report, there were two huge takeaways of the conclusions and suggestions. The first, no surprise, we need to be funding our transit systems. Uh, but the other thing it found looking statewide is the demographics of this state are going to um, demonstrate that it's going to get worse if we don't address the transit funding problem right now. Um, seniors, the outside of uh, Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin is aging pretty uh, rapidly, and so people are outliving their ability to drive, and that will continue to happen. So we need to ensure we have transit access. And then um, at the kind of opposite end of the spectrum, young people, as they're graduating college and deciding where they're going to sort of set up their life, are choosing to live based on whether or not they can live there without a car. So in order for our economies to stay thriving and to bring in new people, we need proper transit systems. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Connie. Our next speaker is Steve Herbie. And he, he and his wife, Pat, have one car in their household, and to get to their many different commitments and, and destinations every day, he often will, will take his bike and uh, place it on the front of the bus and rides, rides the bus. Steve moved with his family from Chicago uh, to Appleton in 1973, and he's worked at uh, Lawrence University for nearly 35 years and is retired now. He had a variety of uh, uh, positions there in administration, student services, fundraising and informational technology. And he's an active volunteer in the community with First Congregational Church, NAMI, Esther, and the Wisconsin United Church of Christ. Uh, and uh, he is uh, going to talk to us today about uh, some of his experiences or some of his perspective as, as a bus rider. Thanks, Connie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, looking back, which is a tendency of people my age. I am surprised by my current enthusiasm for alternative transportation. My dad ran a service station in our hometown and uh, was a natural mechanic and I worked for him when I was in high school. I bought a car at his suggestion when I was 16. I bought a second car um, in partnership with my younger brother in my senior year of high school so that we could have the thrill of drag racing. Uh, with these kinds of formative experiences, I might have developed a lifelong fascination with automobiles. Instead, I'm fascinated with bicycles and public transportation. Like many families, Pat and I owned one car starting out. After moving to Appleton in 1973, we found that bus service and bicycles provided the transportation one of us mostly need needed to get to work, meetings, so forth. And that meant the car was available for other essential family transportation. Until, that is, our oldest son became a senior in high school, and at that point we added a second car, and we're glad to have it. Uh, but as our nest emptied, we re-examined our priorities and decided that once again, one car would be enough. In general, I choose to walk, bike, or take the bus. I sometimes describe this pattern as better for me and better for the environment. Better for me includes not only the exercise I get, 
from moving under my own power, but also the enrichment that comes from being immersed in my surroundings, close to fellow members of our community. I notice more, I feel more connected, and I count these as benefits. It's also less expensive. It costs about $8,000 a year to operate an automobile. What else can Pat and I do with $8,000 a year? And better for the environment certainly includes less use of fossil fuels and less of an impact on our ecological neighborhood just to keep me mobile. But I believe as well that the social environment all of us share is made stronger when I draw from resources that we hold and pay for in common, including public transit. When I take the bus to the Esther office in Nina from my home in Appleton, I'm not only using an energy efficient and environmentally friendly way of getting there, I'm also making a personal commitment to the shared resource that is Valley Transit. I'm widening my experience by interacting with people I would not otherwise see. I remember getting on the bus in Nina on a way back from, uh, from a meeting at the Esther office, and sitting behind a young couple, and uh, they spent the entire trip back to Appleton kissing each other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm widening my experience. <laughs> by interacting with people I would not otherwise see. In those ways, my bus travel helps me to participate in knitting what Martin Luther King Jr. called our single garment of destiny. It helps us give shape to our life together. These are, to me, things well worth doing. And part of the reason that I appreciate the work that has gone into the report that is being discussed today. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I guess you added to what other things you can't do besides texting and driving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next we're going to hear from Emily Derringer, Derringer, and she is from the Winnebago Health Department, and she's going to be talking about the health benefits of. Uh, public transit and health equity. Emily's been with uh, Winnebago County Health Department since 2008, and she works to improve policies, systems, and build environment that impact residents' ability to walk, bike, and be physically active. Also in using the transportation system and connect with people and places. Emily's coordinator of a team who's working to implement Winnebago County's rural-focused bicycle and pedestrian plan created by the county's Health, Highway, and Parks Department. And she's a founding member of Fox Valley Thrives, is where I met her, and that is an alliance working to improve health equity in a three-county region. Thank you, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about how transportation impacts a person's ability to be healthy. Um, so there's a couple different ways that that there's multiple different ways, I'm gonna talk about a couple. Uh, so the transportation system plays an important role in ensuring that people can reach everyday destinations safely, reliably, and conveniently. Access to a variety of transportation options like walking, bicycling, and transit allow residents to go grocery shopping, to work or school, to get their hair cut, check in with the doctor, meet up with friends, or enjoy a local park. All of these things impact a person's ability to be healthy. Nearly half of all transit trips in Wisconsin get people to jobs. Access to good paying jobs is critical in improving health. Having a good paying job makes it easier for workers to live in healthier neighborhoods, provide quality education for their children, secure child care services, and buy more nutritious foods, all of which impact health. By contrast, unemployed residents face numerous health challenges beyond loss of income, including increased occurrences of stress-related conditions like stroke, heart attack and heart disease, and are more likely to be diagnosed with depression. And research shows people classified as working poor are less likely to be offered health insurance at their workplace and are less likely to access preventative health care services covered by insurance, such as blood pressure and cholesterol screenings. Fox Valley employers and transportation service providers are currently working to close some of the transportation gaps that are by providing access where the built environment is lacking 
because they recognize the importance of getting people to work. In addition to good paying jobs, the conditions that we live in are also strongly linked to our ability to be healthy. People living in communities that are walkable, bikeable, and transit oriented are more likely to be physically active, have less weight gain, have lower rates of traffic injuries, and are less exposed to air pollution. Investments in sidewalks, bike lanes, trails, public transit, and other infrastructure that supports physical activity can result in improving individuals' health and decreased healthcare costs. Poor transportation decisions and poor funding can harm health and are not always fair across all communities. Low income and minority neighborhoods are often less likely to contain the built infrastructure of a complete transportation network, such as sidewalks, and lack convenient access to parks, healthcare, and healthy food. Ensuring that all residents have access to a variety of transportation options makes it easier and safer for folks to get from point A to point B, which is an important factor in improving and maintaining health. Thank you, Emily. We talk a lot about the health connection with transportation, and it helps remind, remind us when we travel in a car, you know, how often we, we turn to your neighborhood and the car garage goes up and goes down, and there's absolutely no connection with your neighbors. Okay, our, our final speaker is uh, Rick Dateen, and he is a member of the Valley Transit Commission. And uh, he's lived in Appleton since 1978, and he's a graduate of Lawrence University. And he's been married to Sue for 51 years, and he has two adult children. He retired in 2008 as president of Lamination. It's the business unit of Great Northern Corporation. He's been active community volunteer with Voices of Ben, a reading tutor for first graders with United for Reading Success Program, Valley Transit Commission, and he's active in his church and also coaching with Special Olympics basketball. And today he speaks on his perspective as a member of the Valley Transit Commission. Thank you, Rick. Good morning. Good morning. I did not expect you to read that verbatim, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was good film. Um, I am a member of the Valley Transit Commission and a longtime resident of the Fox Cities. And I would like to say thank you to those who work so hard to produce the comprehensive Transit Access and Equity in Wisconsin report. This is really a fine piece of work. Much of what is in it reflects concerns that are frequently discussed in our Valley Transit Commission meetings. We have a very common themes listening to the folks behind me and, and what occurs in the Transit Commission. We worry about the same things. We do not now, nor have we had for some time, sufficient financial resources to adequately fund public transportation for many of our citizens, people with disabilities, our elderly, or for workers who are looking for cost-effective and environmentally responsible rides to and from their jobs. Our funding shortfall limits both the frequency of service and the areas that we can effectively cover. We are caught in what I would call a zero-sum game, where providing additional service to, for instance, a growing residential area, uh, or to maybe a new major employer, dictates that service somewhere else is going to be compromised. In my years on the Valley Transit Commission, I've been very impressed by what our excellent staff has been able to uh, accomplish with the constraints they face. But we could, and we should do more, much more. However, the resources are rarely there. One answer to our funding dilemma might be the establishment of a regional transit authority. Unfortunately, the state legislature has not understood that this is truly the best solution to our ongoing funding restrictions. And I think Valley Transit and how it operates indicates how a collaborative regional service can work and be good for the citizens in that area. I would like to add a personal note. Our son Andy and his wife Beth, both of whom have disabilities, are very regular and very satisfied riders of Valley Transit. They do not drive. They ride the bus to their jobs at Home Depot and Lawrence University. 
They use the bus to go to movies, visit the mall, go out to eat. Uh, they are known by and are treated well by the Valley Transit drivers. And they enjoy being on the bus. The service is truly important to their independence and their daily living needs. But it could be better. For example, there is no Sunday service when Andy goes to work regularly. We can drive him to Home Depot in about 15 minutes, but it can take him an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, to get back uh, from, from his job. Um, for a lot of folks who had a choice, that's an inconvenience that they wouldn't put up with. For those who don't have a choice, they're glad to, to have that, and they'll, they'll live with that. This is what I call a yay boo or a good news, bad news situation. We're very thankful for what we have. We just wish it could be better. And of course, that's a challenge for all of us concerned about public transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, we certainly heard a lot this morning about how uh, public transportation affects people's lifestyle, it, it, how much time they spend getting places, if they can get places, and um, it, whether or not uh, it might add to, to their health as well. Um, we'd like to ask if there's any questions that you have. John? Are there comment and question? I was happy to see at the recent debate for state senate that the Democratic candidate supports the idea of regional transit authority. Um, I, would have, I would encourage voters to keep that in mind. My question is about the book, The Next Step Communities, which I was privileged to be in a study group on a couple of years ago. Years ago. It talked about communities that really nurtured an environmental appreciation and a collective building uh, promise of the next step communities. Um, a, was analysis done on that for your report? And if not, could that be done in the near future? If what can be done in the near future? It's kind of a comparison and analysis of transforming the Fox Valley into a next step community. Is anyone familiar with that book or is it study? Not familiar with it. Okay. okay. We'll have to look into that. Talk to us more about it. Sure. Because we have uh, people on Fox Valley Thrives, Esther, and um, Elizabeth and I are part of a, a bigger group, a uh, statewide group. It's called Coalition for More Responsible Transportation in Wisconsin. Members of Sierra Club, 1,000 Friends, a lot of the wisdom affiliates and whisper. Any other questions? Nancy. Yeah, I was wondering about plans for dissemination of the report and who you're hoping will pay attention to it. Yeah, so we uh, made the report, we made it really accessible so anybody can pick it up and look at it. So we're hoping kind of the general public sees it. Um, transit riders, I'm sure, will feel refreshed knowing somebody's talking about it, but for non-transit riders to sort of get a perspective of what it could be like, most of us don't even think about how we're going to get someplace. Uh, we think we have to go to the grocery store. It doesn't take us a second to figure out how we're going to get there. Um, but also let, uh, decision makers, transit commissions, it um, has a lot of very specific recommendations for the different systems along the line, like the Sunday service, as well as statewide recommendations. Um, so we hope kind of decision makers um, at the state all the way down to the very local level will take a look at it. Any other questions? Our speakers will be available for some brief interviews before the press leaves, and we're very grateful for each of you coming to cover the event today. Thank you for our speakers, and uh, yeah, we'd like to thank you.